morning, everybody, and welcome to the vlog. You know, here at the Reptarium, as it gets to wintertime, things don't really change that much, right? I mean, we keep it up all the time. The animals are here. We're open. We're always interacting. But that's not the case over at BHB. Obviously, the breeding season coming, brumation season's coming, all that type of stuff. So I thought today I'd maybe take you guys on the steps that I actually go through with BHB and all the processes. It's not all the same for every animal. So what do you say we just head over to BHB and jump right in and have an amazing day together? And again, over at BHB, we're kind of gearing up for the next kind of phase when it comes to actually the brumation part, which is a key part of breeding snakes. And basically, these animals have been off food now, and you can see some of them are even still shedding. We still have to spot clean and stuff like that, but uh, this Mexican Black King is looking really good. Definitely still looks like he wants to eat, for sure, but uh, these guys are clearing themselves out, and that's one of the things that we do is for three to four weeks before we go into a brumative state, which is basically about 52 degrees, we need to clear clear their systems completely out because they won't digest when they kind of go dormant. Now they won't go to sleep sleep, they'll still move around and stuff like that, but they're not able to digest. So if we don't actually clear them out, they could potentially die. So again, we're about three weeks into this and one of the things I want to do is go through and look at each and every animal just to get an idea of like how they're doing, right? You don't want to put an animal into hibernation that isn't doing well. You know, if it's a little bit thin, sometimes we have to keep them out and that could be a number of things. We could actually keep them out for the entire season and just say hey these guys aren't going to brumate this year or we might just feed them for an extra few weeks to kind of get them a little bit more beefed up so that they're actually in a position where they'll go through a hibernation state now you may ask why do we even brumate colubrids right like i mean what's the purpose of it and by the way if you have a pet corn snake king snake milk snake or something like that you don't have to hibernate just like over at the reptarium you don't do anything you just keep them up you keep feeding them but when it comes to a breeding standpoint it really does help in two ways number one that dormancy oftentimes is a great opportunity to get those animals to have that period just before breeding almost like a trigger right the dormancy and then warming up is the trigger it's springtime it's ready to breed let's have eggs let's have babies the other thing that happens is that males go through something that's called spermatogenesis which basically with a cool down oftentimes helps fertility that way the next season when you go to breed them you're gonna have a much higher fertility rate so it's kind of a win-win all over the place not to mention it's kind of nice to be totally honest with you to kind of get the animals out of our hair for a minute what I mean by that is not that we are burden by them, but we can then focus on other things while these guys are sleeping. And once we're in this kind of part of our process, where it's basically three to four weeks after we've been feeding, we actually go into a revamp mode, right? So yeah, we'll still spot clean every single day. And by the way, this is a tangerine Honduran milk snake. Interestingly enough, see how it's going into shed? I've noticed that just before they go into brumation, they actually go through a shed cycle. And then interestingly enough, right after they get out of brumation, they go into a shed cycle. So again, shed cycles and snakes actually act as kind of markers, right? If they go into breeding, brumation, any kind of a thing, they kind of use a shed cycle as a marker. So going into brumation, oftentimes you'll see a shed cycle and then coming out of brumation, you'll oftentimes see a shed cycle. Again, look at that perfect example. This albino Nelson's milk snake just shed out and is ready for brumation. Again, much like the albino tangerine Honduran milk snake, this is just a smaller species of milk snake. Absolutely gorgeous. And again, it's a bittersweet thing, right? Like part of me is like excited to put them into brumation because we can focus on other things. And that means that the breeding season is coming up and stuff like that the other part of me is bummed out because you know I'm not gonna get a chance to see these amazing snakes for a while now don't get me wrong we still go down and check on them and look at them almost every single day but you're not actually working with them. you kind of want to leave them alone right you just basically change the water make sure everything is good because sometimes in brumation an animal just doesn't go to sleep it doesn't calm down and then if it's really restless it can actually lose weight and potentially perish so we want to keep an eye on the animals every single day look at this rhino rat snake right here oh my gosh that thing is amazing of course we have Pinocchio next door at the Reptarium, but I love these guys. Such amazing little Vietnam rat snakes. So absolutely gorgeous. So the next process is going to be to actually revamp all these snakes. We go through and we disinfect every part of the cage because again, their immune system is going to drop a bit when they're in brumation. So we don't want to have any bacteria. We want it to be really, really clean. This tangerine therite is beautiful. And again, this is just about ready to breed. I think this one will have his first breeding season this coming up year. So hopefully with any luck, when this guy wakes up, he's going to be a daddy next year so once we actually get through the entire revamp we're going to actually just transfer these guys from right here into our basement that cools down to about 52 degrees we have a room down there that stays at the temperature and again these guys are going to basically be dark no light or anything like that we only turn the light on to check them sometimes we even just use a flashlight for basically three months
Now pythons, in particular ball pythons, are radically different than obviously colubrids. Now I will say this, a lot of people do a cool down, which is like, let's say it's 82 degrees, 84 degrees, something like that on the cool side of the cage. People will drop at night, oftentimes down to like 75, 76 degrees. We personally actually don't drop the temperatures at all when we breed our pythons, but we do food cycles. So basically what happens is during the summer months, we'll be feeding a maintenance style, enough to keep them happy and healthy and kind of keep the same body weight. And then right around the end of October, we start really increasing the food amount. We'll sometimes double, even triple the amount of food that females will eat. That basically just signals the fact that the breeding season is coming. There's abundance of food, so they better produce follicles. So once we do that, obviously we have to do the same thing, go through all our animals and just make sure that everything is in good shape as far as body weight goes. We'll oftentimes weigh them to make sure that they look good. And then we start to inventory to figure out what males we should breed to what females. And then unfortunately, once we get those breeding schemes done, we have to rearrange all the animals, disinfecting all the cages and all the racks and stuff like that to get them into breeding groups. That way, if we have a particular male that goes to say four or five females, they're all in the same row. The last thing you want to do is be like, oh, this male goes here and over there and over here. Just makes it more confusing. So we have to rearrange everything. But the first thing we have to do is literally go through all the females and make sure that they're all up to body weight. See what males that are either good to go for breeding or new for breeding, not to mention our new stock. So it's a lot of work on the inventory side of things and kind of thinking through what males we should put with what females because what do we want to actually produce? There's so many options when it comes to ball pythons. It's absolutely amazing. And you have to make sure you know what you want to breed. You have to understand the genetics behind everything. And sometimes you have to think out two or three or even four years. Maybe I'm going like, I want to breed this male to this female. And I know I'm going to produce triple heads or quadruple heads. And it's going to take me four or five years to eventually produce hopefully what I want to produce. But you have to think those things through, get the inventory together. But as far as the actual care, all that really changes for us is an increased amount of food. The thing is, is that this time of year is so exciting because again, you have animals that have bred in the past, or maybe you have new animals that are up to size that are super exciting. So you don't really know what's going to happen. I always talk about when you're a snake breeder or a reptile breeder, or maybe any animal breeder, oftentimes you have to think way in advance. You know, I might be thinking two or three years ago that, oh my God, I cannot wait till this particular animal is up to size so I can put it in with this female, so on like that. So really the things I do today may not seem as exciting as hatching snake eggs or cutting eggs or having babies. But the truth is what the work we put in today really is going to dictate how 2020 is going to go. So although those kind of payoffs are the exciting part of it, the truth is this part's exciting for a snake breeder. Finding out what to put together, ultimately putting together, and just in a couple weeks we're going to have males in with females, and hopefully we're going to have the first locks of the year, which is super exciting, which will ultimately lead to those amazing videos that hopefully we'll be shooting next summer of cutting amazing clutches of eggs. Now, a lot of other pythons are just like the ball pythons. Take, for instance, the Stimpsons, Spotted's, Children, Sabus, all those type of animals. We breed the exact same way. We don't really cycle the temperatures. We just cycle the food amount. So we're starting to increase food on these guys. We put them together during the cool down. That's the thing that's interesting about pythons is they actually breed while they're cooling, or in this case, increase amount of food, right? So during that kind of monsoon season where maybe the temperatures drop just a few degrees, that's when they're going to breed. Unlike the colubrids that breed when you bring them out and start warming them up, these guys breed during the kind of dormant or slow down season. Again, they will continue to feed throughout the entire season. That's what makes them so different than let's say colubrids is the fact that you're feeding even more in what we consider kind of the dormant or cool down season, if that makes sense. So pythons pretty much all do it that way. Now, interestingly enough, when it comes to rainbow boas and even some other boas, they'll actually cool down a little bit and go dormant a little bit more than say pythons. So we actually do drop these guys down to about 76, 77 degrees, something like that range. But we do continue to feed them through that period. We're not gonna like overfeed them, but we're gonna continue to maintain feed them through the cool down period, which is typically about two or two and a half months. And then when they warm up, they go in together and start breeding. So unlike the pythons, which is kind of weird that they breed during the winter months, these guys actually will breed during the spring month. Leopard geckos have their own kind of thing as well. Like I said, we do brumate these guys, much like colubrids, but they're a little bit different in the sense that we also take them off of food for about three weeks before we put them into a brumative type of state. So we want to make sure that all the females are nice and big and all the males are big so they can handle it. But we don't cool those guys down to like 50, 52 degrees like we do the colubrids. Typically, we're like, again, in that 65 degree range. And that's going to give them a nice dormant period, which again, helps with kind of that trick 
trigger to breed as well as actual spermatogenesis with the males. Interestingly enough, although we brewmate our leopard geckos typically the end of November, pretty much through the beginning of the year, you can actually manipulate their season all year long. So if you were to actually to have like, let's say a refrigerated room that goes down to 65 degrees, you could brewmate these guys in June and July and then produce geckos off season. A lot of the big gecko producers actually have like six or eight colonies per year. So as one's going into brumation, the other one is coming out, which is pretty cool that you can actually manipulate the cycle like that. But nevertheless, we make sure all of our animals are big, fat, and healthy before going into brumation. And then we'll go ahead and put these guys down just like the colubrids. They go dark for about two months, a little bit shorter than the colubrids, which are typically three months. And uh, then they come up and they start breeding. Now I'm gonna throw another wrinkle in this big, huge boa constrictor. Probably one of the biggest boas I've ever seen in my entire life. But they breed a little bit different than all of them. These guys actually typically breed around the early October period. So you're cooling them off, you're putting them together much like the ball pythons, but they even breed earlier. So if you wait until November, December, oftentimes it's just too late. You really need to get males and females together during the October season. And then unlike ball pythons, typically you want to just have one male and one female. If you kind of spread it to two or three or four females, oftentimes you don't have as much success. If you just keep a male in with a female like this girl right here for like two or three months, oftentimes these guys will ovulate in like December, January, or maybe as late as February. And then they go into what they call a post ovulation shed. So from the time that they ovulate to typically birthing, it's usually about 105 days. And this girl here, I hope she has about 50 or 60 babies because this is one big boa. And breeding reptiles can be a little complicated because there's no kind of roadmap that everything follows the suit, right? Colubrids go into brumation where they go really cold and go off of food. Pythons, we don't cycle the temperature, we cycle food. Rainbows actually cool down a little bit, but we continue to feed. And then there's blue tongue skinks, things like northerns and easterns that literally cool down again, much like the rainbow bows down to the mid 70s, sometimes even low 70s. But these guys actually go off of food. So we don't feed them during the cool down period. So everything is a little bit different. And that's what makes it so exciting is to kind of figure out which animal needs what, right? Every python isn't the same. Every boa isn't the same. You know, with the blue tongue skinks, they actually go into that dormant period. And then as soon as you bring them out, you start feeding them up and then you put them together and it's absolutely amazing. And there's some really gorgeous blue tongue skinks that we're excited about. This happens to be a hypo or what they sometimes call caramel, which is amazing and absolutely gorgeous. And then take a look at this sunrise right here. This is just an animal that is bred for that bright yellow pattern and color to it. Absolutely gorgeous. So this is what they would call a polygenic trait. Again, just breeding specifically for yellows. And you can breed for all kinds of different colors in these guys. But again, this is a northern sunrise. And ooh, doggy, I hope this guy's gonna father some litters next year. Take a look at this. This one's kind of bred for a more pink color. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Again, this is a boy. He's ready to go into brumation or kind of that cool down period. This will be the first time he breeds this coming year. And I cannot wait to pair him up with some really beautiful females. Again, it's kind of what reptile breeders love the most is that although we love hatching and producing animals the truth is we love the kind of mechanism behind it and the beginning of the breeding season is sometimes just as exciting as the actual breeding season itself because you sit back and you think oh my gosh what is going to come of a beautiful animal like this just in a handful of months back here at the Reptarium with this absolutely gorgeous mandarin rat snake. And again, if you guys are keeping reptiles as pets, you don't need to brumate, you don't need to cool down, you don't need to do any of that stuff. Much like here at the Reptarium, we keep it the same all year long. These guys continue to eat, they thrive, they do everything all in all. But I wanted to kind of teach you guys a little bit, if you do want to breed reptiles sometime in the future, the different things for each type of species. And keeping in mind, just because I do it and have had success this way, doesn't mean that someone else doesn't do it and have success a little bit of a different way. I wanted to give you, I don't know, the state of the union of BHB and where we're at as far as the breeding season and where we're going with brumation and all that stuff. It's gonna be an absolutely amazing year. So I know that although we may not be hatching a bunch of snakes, although we do have one more colubrid clutch and one more ball python clutch coming up that we're gonna be able to cut pretty soon, the fact is, is that it's still exciting around here in the off season. And we have a couple projects coming up that's gonna take us through the entire winter season that I think you guys are gonna really enjoy being a part of. In the meantime, if you guys like this video, go ahead and check this video out right here. Here's an entire playlist you guys can roll through if you don't mind. Over on this side, you can hit that subscribe button. While you're at it, can you turn those post notifications on? Remember to have an absolutely wonderful day and you better be kind to somebody. I'll see you guys tomorrow.